Arr, greetings, everyone. Today is May 10th, 2021. Welcome to Conflict Radio. We have got Eric J. Dolan with us today. We're going to be talking about black fly, black flags, blue waters, and pirates, and pirates, and pirates. How is everybody doing today? Eric, you there? I am here. Man, you know, I am so excited for the show. We've been we've been uh, working to get you on for a long time. Do you want to first tell everybody, I guess, uh, well, who you are and uh, what got you interested in pirates? Okay. Well, my name's Eric J. Dolan. I only use my middle name for <clears throat> writing, but people call me you there? Eric. And I uh, I uh, what? Uh, nothing. Go ahead. Uh, cool. And I've been a full-time writer since 2007. Before that, I had a whole bunch of different jobs. I always loved writing. I've written 14 books on a whole bunch of different topics. I wrote a book on the history of lighthouses, the history of whaling, the history of the fur trade, um, the China trade, the history of hurricanes. But Black Flags, Blue Waters, the epic history of America's most notorious pirates came out in, let's see, 2018. And its origin story <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I have pretty bad allergies, so that's why I'm clearing my throat. Yeah, I have to use it's, Flonase it's... before I before I do the show. It actually it's, it's brilliant. You know, you have a ton of books here: A Furious Sky, A, a History right. of American Lighthouses. I mean, we have got to have you come back on. You know, if if hopefully you enjoy our time with us, and uh, you know, it, it's uh, not a complete waste of your time, so we can talk about some of this stuff. I would love to talk about the 500 year history of American hurricanes and a, a history of yeah. the American lighthouse. Absolutely fab, fabulous <clears throat> stuff and, and really curious. But uh, go ahead. What what got you so curious about pirates? Well, I had uh, just finished that book you mentioned on lighthouses, brilliant beacon, a history of the American lighthouse. And I was looking around for another <clears throat> book topic and I had about five or six ideas that I was batting around and I decided that I was going to ask my kids, my two kids who were teenagers at the time, what they thought of the different topics. And when I got to the idea of writing about pirates, both of them got really excited. Their eyes grew wide and they said, that's it, Dad. You've got to write a book about pirates. And you know, they'd grown up on Pirates of the Caribbean, and all kids, everybody seems to love pirates, even though they're pretty nasty people if you look at them <laughs> within historical context. But when my kids got excited about it, I decided that's what I was going to go for. But that, that's too simple of an answer because uh, writers can't just write whatever they want, unless they want to self published, I guess. So. Once I had the idea, I had to convince my literary agent that it was a good idea, and then I had to pitch it to my longtime publisher, which was uh, W.W. Norton and Livewright, uh, to see if they were interested. Unfortunately, all things fell into, into place. Everybody was interested in it, and I wrote the proposal, which sort of outlines what the book was going to encompass, and then... I was off. I got a contract, and I spent about 18 months, 20 months researching and writing it, and then uh, went through a year of editing process. When you go through a major publisher, people don't realize that things don't happen instantaneously. If you're a big celebrity and you got a, or you've got a book that has a current events focus, uh, publishers can move much faster. But for every one of my books, basically, from the moment I handed it to my publisher, it takes almost a year for it to find its way into bookstores because it goes through three different sets of editors, uh, production team. It's, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work, but it makes for a good book in the end that looks nice and hopefully reads well. But so that's how I got, I got onto, onto pirates. I, I didn't grow up loving pirates. I, I enjoyed pirate movies. I certainly liked the, the first couple of the pirates of the Caribbean franchise. I didn't really like the later ones. They got a little bit too, uh, crazy, and I, I had seen other movies and about pirates, and it's it's uh, just a neat topic. And when I was a little kid, I went to Disney World and went on that Pirates of the Caribbean uh, cruise, uh, the 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 uh, the, the uh, whatever you call it, the, the thing they have there. And uh, I just thought it was a neat topic. And writing about it, the reason I really loved writing about it is not because pirates are inherently interesting, which they are. 
it's because the thing that really gets me excited is taking a topic and using it to tell a broader story about American history. And in writing this book, I just was blown away by all the information about how pirates affected uh, colonial America, the interplay between the colonists and the pirates, and just the evolution of uh, the colonies from the late 1600s to the uh, 1720s is absolutely fascinating. And the interplay with the United Kingdom or England at the time, Great Britain, it just was a fascinating story of how America evolved and how pirates played an important role and often quite a damaging role in that process. You know, it's fascinating stuff, isn't it? I, I grew up in uh, New Jersey, and of course, we always have the, you know, the, I guess the tale of the Jersey Devil there. But, but deep in the Pine Barrens, there was a hidden town, a pirate town, if you will, that all of the pirates used to hang out and drink at. I, I mean, was it common for, I guess, the pirate ships to come in and they all kind of hung out together, or did they did they fight with each other at all? Well. I don't know about that community you're mentioning. I've been in the Pine Barrens. Uh, when I was in college, my roommate, uh, who later dropped out of college, he owned a beekeeping company, and he and I went down to the Pine Barrens once to pick up, with an 18-wheeler, to pick up tons of beehives uh, that were pollinating all the blueberries, the high bush blueberries down there. But anyway, I'm not familiar with that story, but I, I've heard many stories about pirate rendezvous in different places, some of which have evidence, others which don't, but the only real places that pirates regularly resorted to that we know of were, one, Madagascar in the late 1600s when the Red Sea men, the pirates that went over the Indian Ocean and attacked Mughal shipping, transiting between the Indian subcontinent and the Red Sea ports of Jeddah and Mocha. The pirates used to go to Madagascar, and there were women there, and they would hang out there and have a little pirate community. And then, of course, what your listeners are probably more familiar with, or what most people are more familiar with, is uh, the Bahamas, Nassau, and, and the island of Providence, uh, where for, in the 17 teens, uh, for a sh relatively short period of time, that was a uh, <clears throat> pirate uh, hideout and, and rendezvous. And uh, if you see the TV show Black Sails, they they represent that in, in a highly fictional format. But uh, this thing on the Pine Barrens, I'm not familiar with that. There were other instances, short stories, like uh, around Blackbeard's time, there were some pirates who would hang out near Ocracoke Island and other places along the North Carolina coast, come ashore occasionally. But there was no regular hangout other than those two. And when pirates did go to Madagascar or in the Bahamas, they often got along fairly well, but sometimes fights broke out and there were problems and arguments over the disposition of wages. Uh, it's always a bad combination to have a bunch of <clears throat> pirates who are naturally somewhat ornery, uh, hyped up kind of individuals drinking and around a lot of money. There was a tale in Madagascar, it's true, about some pirates gambling, and uh, and then they were trying to divide the spoils from a recent trip, and there was an argument, and they ultimately fought to the death. The two two sides, I think seven men on each side, decided to have a fight to the death, and ultimately all of them were slain, except for uh, was it one or two I think that survived, and they split the money. So it's not a good combination <laughs> to have uh, drinking money, people that are outcasts from society, have uh, many of which had, I think, anger issues, <laughs> although they wouldn't use that term back then. Uh, but then again, there are pirates who got along. Sometimes pirates on an individual ship got along quite well, and pirates used to uh, sail sometimes in the company of other uh, ships and have mini armadas, and to do that, you had to have some level of communication and some level of trust with your fellow pirates. All right. Well, let's get into some of these uh, pirates. Uh, first off, let me give a shout out to everybody that is here so far in the chat room. We got Paul Beska here, Hugh Godarn. I don't know if I've ever said that right. <laughs> Chuck Chuck Bam, Barry, John Clark, Blue Chicken, 
Tony Fradson <laughs> is here. Let's see uh, who else we got. The Happy Plague Doctor. Uh, Kingfish is here. Pink Chicken. Uh oh, Blue. <laughs> it, blue Blue Chicken better watch out because Pink Chicken is in the house. And uh, all right. So you mentioned you mentioned uh, Blackbeard. Can we get into him a little bit? Was was he a captain of a ship? And I'm I'm you know in all honesty, how did these did these guys just build ships themselves? Did they steal ships, like a uh, <clears throat> blue Bluebeard or a uh, yeah Blackbeard. How did he get a ship? And um, who was he? Well, Blackbeard. There's a lot of mystery surrounding Blackbeard, as there is around a lot of pirates. Uh, no pirates, unfortunately sat down and wrote their memoirs. Uh, most of the information that we have about pirates comes from people that they plundered or pirates that were captured. There were trials, and uh, there were a lot of times there were depositions that were taken and trial transcripts that provide incredibly valuable information about the pirates. But Blackbeard, or Edward Thatch, or That is his last name. There are a variety of ways in which it's spelled. We don't know too much about his origins. Some people came say he was born in England. Others say Jamaica. Others say North Carolina. There's no definitive proof of exactly where he came from. Other people say that he was a privateer during the Spanish War, the War of the Spanish Succession from 1702 to 1713. And once the war ended, like many privateers that were suddenly thrown out of work, he turned to piracy. That is certainly a conceivable story, but he sort of enters the history books at, or in around 1714, 1715 when he shows up in the Caribbean. And how did he get his uh, first boats? Like most pirates, they stole. <laughs> they they would start out small. Um, very The only pirate that of any note that we know of who built his own vessel, and we might get into him a little bit later, is a guy named Steve Bonnet, who was the man of means from Barbados who built his own pirate vessel. Well, Blackbeard probably started out with a small shallop or a pinnace or a, uh, even a rowboat. Some pirates start out with rowboats, and they'd attack another larger vessel, and if they liked that vessel's sailing qualities, they would take that as their new uh, pirate flagship. And then as they plundered more and more vessels, they sometimes would add to their fleet. And Blackbeard, ultimately, when he uh, left the Caribbean for a cruise along the east coast of the colonies, his most famous cruise was when, in 1718 uh, when he blockaded um, uh, Charleston Harbor. He had uh, four, I think it was five actually, five ships including uh, the, the main one, Queen Anne's Revenge, which is a former uh, French ship, La Concorde, a rather large ship. And he had other vessels and up to 400 men who blockaded Charleston Harbor for the better part of the week. They didn't really get much. They got about 1,500 pounds worth of money and a, a medicine chest because as the – Theory goes, we're not 100% sure of this, but uh, while Blackbeard and his men were in the Caribbean, they caroused with women and got various sexually transmitted diseases. And by the time they were up off uh, South Car uh, Charleston, uh, many of his men were quite sick and they wanted medicine uh, such as mercury, which was used at the time, to treat syphilis and other of these sexually transmitted diseases. So it's rather strange. A lot of people wonder about that, why he had the entire city of Charleston like under his gaze. He wasn't allowing any vessels in and out. Why didn't he demand more? And we can only speculate. Uh, some people said, why didn't he go ashore and just take what he wanted? Well, there were quite a few people in Charleston at the time. There were a number of people who were able to fight men, and there were 100 cannons in Charleston's inner harbor that would have caused some problems to uh, Blackbeard and his men had they actually gone into the harbor instead of staying a couple of miles off shore. But um, – so Blackbeard, another interesting thing about Blackbeard is there was a book written in 1724 called The General History of Pirates, which is what was used for centuries thereafter to paint the, uh, the image of Blackbeard. And it depicted him as this violent 
guy. And in reality, during the year and a half or two years that he was active, we have no record other than his final battle against British forces and one other instance where Blackbeard actually was violent towards anybody else. He was also depicted in this 1724 book as having 14 wives and prostituting them to many of his crewmen, which there's no evidence of that, that he was married at all. Uh, some people say that he had a house in North Carolina, near Bath, North Carolina. Uh, there's no evidence of that either. But it painted a picture, a word picture of Blackbeard as this fearsome, incredibly successful pirate. He may very well have been fearsome in, in battle. We don't have a good record of it. He wasn't particularly successful. As far as we can make out, at the end of his career in November of 1718, he had not accumulated a huge amount of money, and he had quite a few other pirates under him, and uh, any money they had would have been distributed relatively equally up to that point. So he was neither an incredibly successful pirate nor was he an incredibly vicious pirate, but we have these pictures of him. And one other thing that Charles Johnson, who some people think was uh, Daniel Defoe, uh, who wrote this 1724 book, said was that Blackbeard would go into battle. He would have his hair uh, sort of twirled around, and at the end of his hair, he would tie these matches that he would light while he was going into battle, and the idea being that the smoke and flames coming from these lit matches would surround his face and make him even more fearsome than he otherwise would have been. Well, it's absolutely ridiculous. There's no record of him going into battle or attacking a ship with flames shooting out from under his cap. Think about how incredibly dangerous it would be to have flames coming out close to your hair while you're going into battle. But that's another image that we have of Blackbeard that really sticks in people's uh, minds. But I can tell you one thing that's true about Blackbeard. He did have a black beard. There are eyewitness accounts saying that he was a tall, lanky man with a very long black beard that he would tie up in black ribbons. So at least his name is appropriate, if not his larger than life image that has come down to us through the centuries but he had a fascinating story nonetheless yeah he sounds like a pretty interesting character you know i i <laughs> i often wonder about the crew of of uh i guess these ships i mean what are they just putting an ad in the paper for a pirate or do you just no. <laughs> like if you wanted to be a pirate like like what do you do you have to find a ship and, and go and, and, you know, talk to Blackbeard like, hey, I, I want a job? No, well, at any any uh, port in the, the colonies, there are a lot of sailors, a lot of unemployed mariners, and they get to talking and they hatch a plan. Maybe they want to be pirates. They've heard stories about great wealth that's been obtained by pirates that went before them. Some of the stories are totally total baloney. But uh, pirates are a lot like gamblers going into, into a casino. When you walk into a casino, you have high hopes, you're excited, the adrenaline's rushing, you think you're going to hit it big. Most of them leave the casino having lost money, and that's exactly the same profile of most pirates. Uh, most of them were incredibly successful. A few were, and those few stories of great success got people very excited. And keep in mind, at this time, uh, the bottom rungs of society from which pirates were mostly uh, culled, uh, it was a very poor, a brutish existence. These were poor people. They didn't have many opportunities, and piracy could have looked quite attractive. So if you gather together a couple of guys or maybe 10 or 20 guys that want to become pirates, the next thing is to get a ship. Maybe you steal a ship that's in the harbor, or there's this one pirate guy named Whirly who started out in New York City. He grabbed a rowboat with three other guys. They attacked a small fishing vessel that was slightly bigger than the rowboat. They took it over. They transferred to that slightly bigger vessel, and then they kept going up the ladder over the next couple of months, getting larger and larger ships. Uh, and uh, then they become a more fearsome fighting force. Another way that pirates get crew members is 
not by advertising, but when you capture another ship, let's say that you're a pirate out there and you capture a merchant vessel that has on board 28 crewmen, you will immediately, as a pirate captain, especially if you need additional crewmen, which is something they always were in search of, you would ask the people, you'd say to the people on this merchant ship, how many of you will join us and sign the articles, the pirate articles, the pirate code, and become pirates yourselves? And quite a few people didn't necessarily have other great prospects waiting for them at home decided to become pirates. So that was one way that pirates augmented their crew. Another way was the force men to join. If people didn't step forward, but you absolutely needed additional crewmen on your pirate ship, you could just take the men, force them onto your ship, and uh, sign the articles in their stead or ultimately uh, get them to, to sign them over time. Wow. So there are multiple, multiple ways that the pirate ships got their crews. People came from a lot of different uh, directions, but once you were on the pirate ship and part of the crew, then uh, your role in life, at least in the near-term future, was pretty well defined. So, so how did the local law treat pirates? Were, I mean, was it kind of like the the Italian mob, where where they just kind of <laughs> look the other way? You know, they they're paid off. They, you know, they don't pay no attention, or were they like actively hunting these guys? Well, it depends which time frame you're considering, and my book sort of is split into two different eras. Prior to 1700, most of the pirates, and I focus on America's pirates, pirates that came from the American colonies or operated off the American coast and in the Caribbean. So prior to 1700, most of the pirates were these so-called Red Sea Men. During King William's War, when England was at war against France, uh, one of the ways that you enhance your Navy's power during times of war back then was to hand out letters of mark uh, to enable private individuals to send out their ships as privateers. Those privateers can attack the enemy of your enemy and bring those ships back into port and share in the spoils from the prize. So during King William's War, in the colonies, there were a number of colonial governors who handed out letters of mark to make these merchants privateers, their ships privateers, and they were supposed to go out and attack the French. But what happened is these privateering licenses were shams. They were totally, total baloney. The governors knew it. They were uh, basically giving the privateering commission to this captain or merchant and, and his crew, and instead of going to attack the French, they went around the Cape of Good Hope into the Indian Ocean where they attacked uh, Mughal ships that weren't French but had a lot of money on board. And so they basically acted as pirates, and the colonial governors knew that these privateers were not actually going out after the French, but they were in collusion with the pirates because they – charged for the letter of mark for the privateering commission and then when the pirates came back if they had been successful and they came back sailing into New York Harbor for example uh, they would have to pay the governor perhaps a hundred pieces of eight each pirate just to be allowed to land in New York and not be accosted by the local officials so that's prior to 1700. The officials definitely looked the other way, and they benefited from it. And also the people, the colonists, benefited because these pirates, these Red Sea men, were the fathers, brothers, and sons of the colonists themselves. They were going halfway around the world to attack uh, these infidels, non-Christians, Muslims. That's how they were looked at at that time. And... They were stealing money from these quote-unquote infidels and bringing it back to the American colonies that were starved of currency. So people welcomed pirates with open arms. But then you shift fast forward 
to the 17 teens when you have the Pirates of the Caribbean pirates. That era is totally different. After the War of the Spanish Succession, the colonies were uh, significantly more uh, economically stable, and the pirates were no longer attacking these infidels halfway around the world. Instead, the piracy in the 17 teens was focused almost exclusively on English ships, and many of those English ships or British ships were American merchant vessels. So instead of attacking somebody else, these pirates were now attacking Americans. So of course, if your ox is being gored and you're being stolen from, you don't like these pirates anymore. So that's why everybody was basically against pirates in the 17 teens and early 1720s. The British government didn't like them because they were breaking the law and they were attacking merchant ships. The Americans didn't like them because they were causing havoc along the coast and they were stealing from the merchants who were the pillars of their communities. So that's when you had almost a worldwide manhunt for for pirates and there were nearly 400 pirates that were hanged in that short about six or seven year period because everybody other than the pirates was united against the pirates so it's really two very different time frames and one of the most important things in understanding how history operates and this is my view but it's not unique to me and it's so it's it's common sense you have to follow the money Money is such an important motivating factor in the history of the world, and in particular in the history of America, the colonies, and the United States that followed, that unless you understand where the money is flowing, who's benefiting and who is not, you're going to have a tough time understanding people's motivations and truly understanding what's going on. And the simplest way to say it with respect to pirates is that prior to the 1700s, prior to 1700, the Americans were benefiting from piratical activities. So people loved the pirates, other than the British government, which didn't like the pirates. In the 17 teens, the Americans were not benefiting. They were getting screwed by the pirates. So they hated the pirates. Yeah. So they joined forces with the English government and Parliament, who had long been in opposition to pirates, and uh, that made it much more difficult for the pirates to operate. And ultimately, at the end of the 17 teens, uh, the Bahamas were uh, taken back by the British government, and the pirate stronghold down there was uh, eliminated. And by 1726, there were hardly any pirates left. They had been beaten down by the society from which they had profited for so long. Yeah, yeah, and there's a, there's a whole different kind of pirate out there now, I guess. But let's talk <laughs> about some of these older ones here. I wanted to get you on uh, to talk about Henry Morgan as well. Is, <clears throat> is he the one that they named the Captain Morgan rum after? Yes. <laughs> All right. He's, well, he's, how how he's did more, that come he's about? More, he's more famous for that. <laughs> than he is for what he actually did in his life. He would get a big kick out of it if he could come back and see what had happened because uh, Henry Morgan was a hard-charging, raucous kind of fellow. He also was an alcoholic, and he died from complications due to basically drinking too much and having too wild of a life. So I think he would appreciate the fact that his, yeah. his face <laughs> – well, he must or a have, characterization of him as a rum bottle. He must have been drinking that Captain Morgan, I guess, right? Like, yeah. is there is there any? I mean, was he drinking rum? Is there any? Is there any actual facts that that maybe they're using the same recipe he did? Oh no, I don't. I don't think that. I I, I don't know. I I I'm, I don't know. <laughs> the I mean, that'd be great, Captain, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I don't think that they would have a recipe back then, but definitely rum was on the menu back then that was one of the main the drinks especially in the Caribbean when we started having the, the you know the, the sugar plantations and molasses and all that sort of stuff so uh, I don't know if they got their recipe <laughs> from that era I think they just used his reputation and again the, the fact that pe 
people are so fascinated by pirates, you can just slap a pirate on almost anything and it becomes attractive to a, a large part of the purchasing Yeah, well, you have the, the skull and bones flag, right? Was that a real flag yeah. that they used or is that just something that, that we've made up? No, we didn't make it up. Uh, the... Uh, the, the Pirate's Flag, the Jolly Roger, as they call it, that uh, started in the early 1700s. I think the earliest record of one is about 1701, but it really, again, was in the 17-teens that pirates had these personal ensigns or uh, pennants that they would fly, and some of them did have skull and crossbones. A lot of them did. I mean, the skull... The skull and the skeleton represented death, so that was what they wanted to get across. The whole purpose of the pirate flag was to advertise who you were. Because if you're out in the ocean and a ship's coming towards you, you don't know necessarily who they are unless there's some characteristics or things that you could point to. So what would happen is when a pirate approached another a merchant vessel, they usually would uh, try to use a false flag. Like they may, they may raise the Union Jack to appear as nothing more than a British ship. And then when they get close in, they haul down the Union Jack and they up goes the pirate flag. And that signals to the merchant ship that you're dealing with a pirate. You better decide really quickly what you're going to do. If you're going to fight, there's going to be a really bad fight coming your way. But if you surrender, maybe you'll be treated well and all that will happen is you'll be all your cargo will be taken and maybe your vessel will be taken and you'll be placed on another ship or placed on a nearby uh, piece of land. So the pirate flag was the pirate's uh, calling card and we do know because of descriptions what a lot of these pirate flags look like. Uh, Edward Lowe, who's this particularly nasty pirate, had a pirate flag that was a skeleton which represented uh, death and then one hand was raised aloft and was holding an hourglass, which represents the idea that your time is fast running out to make a decision. You better choose wisely whether to fight or surrender. And on the other hand, there was a harpoon or dart that was piercing a heart. And from it, three drops of blood were dripping, which is another representation of death. And what's interesting about Edward Lowe and his flag is – we have newspaper, contemporary newspaper accounts that describe in great detail that flag. Most people who have written about the era of pirates say that that's the same flag that Blackbeard had. But unfortunately, there's no contemporary evidence pointing to exactly what Blackbeard's flag looked like. So my guess is that it might not have been the same, but it, perhaps it had a skeleton on it, maybe had a cutlass raised. Uh, so there are a lot of different images. But yes, the pirate flag is real. What's really unfortunate is that there's not a single pirate flag from the golden age of piracy that is known. Uh, oh, there, is that... a there is a pirate flag that uh, a museum in uh, Finland has from the early 1800s that has a skull and crossbones and I have a picture of that in the book but if any of your listeners are at a yard sale or an antique shop or <laughs> any place or in the attic of their parents or grandparents house and they find rolled up what looks like a really old pirate's flag you know contact Antiques Roadshow because if you find a real pirate's flag That'll be worth a huge amount of money. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you that if they had any of those flags left over from those days. Uh, you know, I bet you yeah. there's one hidden away somewhere. Somebody, somebody's who whose uh, great great grandfather was a pirate or something is hidden in a in a <laughs> chest somewhere in the attic, right? It's, it's got to be. Could be. Could probably, be. Yeah. Probably one out there somewhere. So, getting back to Henry Morgan, what what is he best known for other than the the Captain Morgan, like? If, if if I was making rum and I'm going to name it after a pirate, why would I choose him other than he was a big drinker? <clears throat> well, uh, he arrives in Jamaica in about 1655, and you have to think about what the Caribbean was like. It was sort of like the Wild West on the ocean. Uh, there was a lot of there were a lot of buccaneers around, which are sort of pirates by another name, and England was had their their 
colony on Jamaica and the governor there was trying to protect his colony as best he could but the English government didn't send him much in the way of military support or naval support so what the governors of Jamaica did is they developed alliances with some of the local buccaneers who happened to hate the Spanish uh, government and Spaniards in particular and of course England and Spain were for centuries had been enemies so the governors of Jamaica made a pact with some of the buccaneers they said you can come to Jamaica you can come to Port Royal you can operate out of this port we will not bother you you could spend your money here in the brothels and the and you know and the, the grog shops or whatever but in return we ask that you go out and attack Spanish shipping which is what the buccaneers wanted to do anyway and when you come back by the way you need to give a certain percentage of whatever you whatever loot you get you have to share it with the uh, Jamaican government so everybody made out from their perspective and it, along comes Henry uh, Morgan and he um, uh, in about in the 1660s he gets a privateering license. Uh, they're not, not really privateers because the, at the time, uh, England and, and Spain are not officially at war. Uh, that creates some problems, but th that was pretty common back then. And the thing that he's most famous for in 1671, he took a huge, uh, a pretty big armada. They landed on the Isthmus of Panama. They traveled across the Isthmus to Panama City and they sacked the city. Unfortunately for Morgan and his men, the Spanish governor of Panama City had been tipped off that they were coming. So he was able to load a lot of the riches of the city onto ships and they left before Morgan arrived. But some were still there and there still was a lot of money in the city making it more difficult for Morgan to get it however was that the governor had ordered the city to be burned as soon as Morgan arrived and it was so he and his men spent a couple of weeks sifting through the ashes and they were able to find a lot of jewels a lot of gold and uh, they became quite rich brought back and shared it with the governor of Jamaica who was really happy for a little while but the problem was uh, England and Spain had become, uh, they, they had signed a treaty of friendship right after Morgan left Port Royal. So when, at the time that he left, they were, um, you know, sort of nominally at war. But while he was away, peace was signed. So Spain viewed Morgan's activities as nothing less than piracy. And King Charles II uh, decided that to make nice with Spain somebody's head had a role so the governor of Jamaica was hauled back to London put in the Tower of London and then a few months later uh, Morgan was hauled back to London and arrested for attacking uh, the Spanish outpost but what happens uh, Charles II the King of England was also known as the Merry Monarch. He was a hard drinking, sort of body guy himself, and he found Morgan to be a uh, what's what's the word? Uh, yeah, sort of one of his. He he saw himself reflected in Morgan. They got along, excuse the pun, royally, <laughs> drinking and swapping stories. And in the end, everything was forgiven. Uh, Morgan was forgiven. The governor of Jamaica was let out of the Tower of London. And it's basically because money covers all sorts of sins. Morgan had brought a lot of money to Jamaica and to the British, the English coffers. And then the king actually made Morgan the governor of Jamaica, sent him back there to root out all the pirates, all the buccaneers. Oh, wow. And, do, he, he had a tough time doing that, but then he 
drunk himself to death. And I think it was in 1688 that he finally died of the result of too wild of a life. But I want, I want to go back for one second just to make clear that the reason that Panama City was a target and the reason that the Sp Spanish were a target at this time of almost all buccaneers and later pirates is that because Spain had uh, ruthlessly uh, crushed the Incas and the Aztecs in Central and South America and had forced these subjugated native peoples to work the mines, the silver and the gold mines. So in the late 1500s and the 1600s and into the 1700s, a huge flood of gold and silver, both bullion, uh, you know, ingots, and coins like pieces of eight and gold doubloons were streaming out of Central and South America on Spanish ships going to the Philippines on the Pacific side and going back to Spain on the Atlantic side and that created a natural focal point and magnet for piratical activity and that's what the pirates were after for they were after they were after these uh, heavily laden treasure ships I can't remember who it was in the 1950s a bank robber got uh, got caught and they asked him why do you rob the banks and he said because that's where the money is well, it's the same thing that pirates did. They went to where they thought the money would be, and Spanish treasure ships were a, a great target for many, many decades. All right. Well, uh, let me give a shout-out real quick to everybody in the chat. we got a, quite a few people joining us from Australia. I see Paul Beska and Sapphire Elf is with us. Uh, it seems we have a little bit of a love affair going on in the chat room between Blue Chicken and Pink Chicken. I would imagine in the coming weeks we're going to have baby chicken in here as well. So uh, I just want to, want to say hi to Johnny Dazzles. Make sure you guys are hitting that like button because it really helps us with the algorithm. So moving on from uh, Captain Morgan, I suppose, let's talk a little yep. bit about Captain William Kidd. Now, uh, I, I don't suppose that this is Billy the Kid survived and... and uh, no. <laughs> and, you know, decided to be a pirate. Captain William Kidd is his own guy. You want to tell us a little bit about him? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> William Kidd, again, is in the era before, roughly before 1700. Uh, we don't, he might have been a privateer for a little while. He was a mariner. And when King William's work came about, he was living in New York. He had married a wealthy widow. Uh, he wanted to go back to sea, so he went to London hoping to get uh, a position in the English Navy. He didn't get that, but through some connections, they offered him something different. As I mentioned before, England was at war with France. So what the king did and what, what these powerful people did is they gave William Kidd two different commissions. One commission was to go into the Indian Ocean and to attack pirates there because England was really upset with these Red Sea men who were operating in the Indian Ocean because they were attacking the Mughal ships and the Mughal Empire was critical to the English East India Company which was a bulwark of the English economy. And the emperor, Aurangzeb, of the Mughal Empire, was would shut down trade after these pirates would attack, and that devastated the East India Company's bottom line, which in turn uh, crippled uh, England's finances. So they had a built-in interest in getting rid of pirates. So one thing that William Kidd was asked to do, he got this commission to be a privateer, essentially, to go to the Indian Ocean and to attack pirates. But since they were at war with France, since England was at war with France, they said, hey, let's give this guy, William Kidd, a second commission where he can act as a privateer to attack uh, French ships. Yeah, I misspoke before. He didn't get a privateering commission to attack pirates. He just got a special commission to attack pirates. Then he got a privateering commission to attack specifically French ships. So William Kidd goes back to New York. He gets a crew together. A lot of the crewmen are former pirates. 
And because they're acting as privateers, it's no no prey, no pay. So if they don't catch somebody, uh, they don't get paid. So they go into the Indian Ocean, and for many, many months, William Kidd and his men are having no luck finding either the French or pirates. So slowly, but inevitably, William Kidd veers into piracy. He decides to attack Mughal shipping, and he goes up to the mouth of the Red Sea and tries to attack some Mughal ships there, but is beaten off by a uh, English military uh, vessel, a frigate. And then they go over to the Indian subcontinent, and they attack a few small ships, take stuff from them, and become small-time petty pirates. But his claim to fame in the Indian Ocean is that he attacked a couple of large Indian ships that had a lot of money on board. Uh, he claimed that they were legitimate targets because they had French passes. But the truth was they were both Indian ships. They just happened to have French passes because everybody who was on the ocean at that time had false, uh, not only false flags, but false papers to basically tell somebody else that they could be anything from a Dutch ship to a French ship to an English ship, depending on who was attacking them and what identity would get them out of trouble. So he was attacking these Indian ships. The emperor got upset again with the English. The East India Company suffered. There was a major manhunt launched to find William Kidd. And by the time, to make a long story a little shorter, by the time he goes back into the Atlantic, down to the Caribbean and then up to Long Island, he finds out that people are searching for him because he's a pirate. And he goes back to one of his former investors, Governor Bellamont of New York and Massachusetts, which were together at the time, tries to get some protection. But Governor Bellamont knows that there's uh, uh, that the King of England wants William Kidd's head, basically. So they send him back to London where he languishes in jail for the better part of a year. They finally have a trial. They find him guilty of murder because he had killed one of his crewmen, but also of piracy. And those French passes that he thought would get him off uh, mysteriously disappeared. But even if they had been there, they might have gotten him off from being prosecuted for attacking the Indian ships since they appeared to be French ships. But he also committed some other minor acts of piracy that were pretty clear. So they find him guilty. Uh, William Kidd tries to negotiate with the English government saying, hey, I left, I left lots of money, 30, 40,000 pounds worth of money down in the Caribbean. If you let me out of jail and give me a ship, I'll go down there, I'll get the money for you, and I'll bring it back. Well, they don't bite on that because they had actually already sent ships down to the Caribbean to look for his supposed treasure uh, because he had let slip where it might be laying, and they didn't find anything. So um, William Kidd, uh, the day, the morning of his execution, he gets rip-roaring drunk, which is quite common, and he's brought to uh, execution dock, they put the noose around his neck. They pull away the board beneath him. He drops precipitously and hits the ground because the rope broke. <laughs> so he was suddenly brought out of his drunken stupor, and he begged for forgiveness, which he hadn't done before. But no forgiveness was there for William Kidd. Uh, the uh, noose, a new noose was called up, a new uh, length of rope. They wrapped it around his neck again. They tried a second time, and this time the rope held, and William Kidd went off into eternity. And what they did with his body afterwards is kind of gruesome. Uh, the English government wanted to have a symbol that could scare other either pirates or would-be pirates from pursuing that type of life. So they took William Kidd's body, they slathered it in tar, then they put it in a iron cage, hung it from a gibbet at the mouth of the Thames River, where according to contemporary sources, 
it remained there for many, many years, slowly decaying and the birds probably eating it at various points. But it stayed there as a, a sign and a symbol, you know, be careful what you do because if you become a pirate, this this is what might happen to you. Yeah, wow, that that's uh, that's crazy. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it kind of sounds like something Vlad the Impaler would do. <laughs> Poor Captain Kidd, right? And, yeah, and I have to add something here. It's kind of interesting. I live in Marblehead, Massachusetts. <clears throat> there are a lot of people who have written books who claim that William Kidd was totally railroaded and that he was not a pirate at all. And it was just a vendetta on the part of the English government, and they just needed somebody to sacrifice to make the emperor of uh, the Mughal emperor happy, and so that trade could resume between India and the East India Company. Well, I, I'm not. The, those books, a lot of them are, are quite good, and they have persuasive arguments. I just happen to disagree. But the reason I mentioned that I live in Marblehead is there's a Scottish. A uh, gentleman who lives in my town, who used to be the editor of the largest Scottish newspaper, and he is a William Kidd fanatic, and he believes very strongly that William Kidd was railroaded, and he's been spearheading an effort in recent years to get a statue to William Kidd uh, back in uh, where is he, where does he want? I don't remember what town he wants it in. But back, back in Scotland, because William Kidd was Scottish, and he um, wants to get a formal pardon issued by the British government. I think the Queen has to do it uh, to exonerate William Kidd. And he, he's doing all that now. I, I don't know where it stands. Uh, yeah, I guess wonder is... how that will work out, huh? <laughs> I, I don't think it's going to happen, but who knows, you know? Now, More do any of, any of these pirates that we're talking about, do any of them have living family today that you know of? Yeah. Uh, well, some of them do, and this is another sort of mysterious area. After I wrote the book, I went out and I probably gave 60 or 70 talks all over the – mainly the East Coast, a couple on the West Coast. And <laughs> – during my after my talks, people will come up, hopefully buy a cop, buy a copy, and chat with me. And at least two people at two different talks came up to me and told me, swore that according to their family lore, they are descendants of Blackbeard. There's no evidence that Blackbeard had any kids. I don't know how you prove that, but maybe it's true. Uh, there are also people that claim to be descendants of uh, Sam Bellamy, for example, the wit of fame and the 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 treasure that went down off Cape Cod and I'm sure that there are other pirates certainly Red Sea pirates who survived who weren't hanged they came back to their communities and uh, they had children many of them so there must be many people that are alive today if they've done their genealogy they can trace their roots back to some or another pirate back then but for the really famous pirates that most people have heard about uh, I don't know a lot about their descendants. Steed Bonnet, for example, which we might talk about, he, he had a couple of kids. Uh, maybe yeah. they got married and had kids, and it's gone down the generations. So there are people out there who can claim that they're descended from pirates. I know that. But I, I didn't really write about that in the book, and I don't have the specifics on who they might be or where they might be. Uh, another person came to one of my talks and told me he was a descendant of William Kidd. And that may or may not be true because William Kidd did have a daughter, Sarah, and she survived. I, I don't remember if she had kids, though. So. Yeah, you know, it's just incredible. I mean, I, I would I would love to have, like, a great-grandfather as a pirate <laughs> or something. I, I think that would be awesome. So let's talk about Steve Bonnet a little bit. Who? I mean, uh, I guess I, just to let everybody know, I, I have six names on the list here of uh, pirates to talk about today. We're... We're down to three left, and Steve Bonnet is one of them, so you mentioned it. Who is he? Well, Steve Bonnet uh, was a wealthy sugar plantation owner in Barbados in the early 1700s, 17 teens. And about 17, 16, 17, 17, he decided to become a pirate. 
And it was a strange decision because, as I said, most pirates came from the lower echelons of society. And here's Steve Bonnet, a fairly wealthy, well-bred, educated individual. Yeah, you, decides think, you think he would have, like, the best ship of all, right? Yeah, well, that's part of the story. Uh, he... He decided to become a pirate. We don't know exactly why. Some people said, some of the contemporary accounts say that he might have gone insane or a little nuts. Other people say that it was uh, because he wasn't getting along too well with his, his wife, I guess, and he decided to leave, <laughs> leave the marriage in a most dramatic way. But since Steve Bonnet had, was a man of means, he built his own pirate ship. He built a, a sloop, probably about 70 feet long, 60 or 70 feet long, and uh, then unlike other pirates who are uh, the incentive for pirates to become pirates is that they get to share in the profits of any ships that are plundered. They usually they, they didn't get paid up front, but Steve Bonnet needed a crew, so he basically <laughs> offered salaries to these people to join him in piracy, and he left Barbados. He had a couple of captures. He didn't really know much about sailing. One of the neat things about his ship is in the captain's cabin, he had built-in bookcases because he brought along his private library, at least part of it, thinking that he would have time to read, I guess, during his leisure or down out, downtime. But Steve Bonnet had some success, but he also had some noted failures. He relied heavily on the people that were on board to sail the ship because that was not his forte. And uh, then he tangled with a, a rather large Spanish ship that nearly destroyed his sloop, the Revenge. After that entanglement, he went to uh, Nassau, and uh, there he met Blackbeard. And Blackbeard liked Steed Bonnet's ship. So Blackbeard convinced Steed Bonnet to join forces to give Blackbeard the captaincy of the Revenge and just relax in the captain's cabin while Blackbeard took the ship and was a pirate. Don't, don't worry, Steed, because Steed Bonnet was injured. And he said, you know, basically... Nurse your injuries, get better, uh, we'll go out pirating, I'll run the ship, don't worry. So Steve Bonnet apparently agreed to this. They went out, and this is the beginning of Blackbeard's reign and him gathering more and more ships. They, Steve Bonnet and Blackbeard hung together for quite a few months, and Steve Bonnet got better. One of the ships they captured uh, was better than the Revenge, so Blackbeard took that one and put Steve Bonnet back in charge of his ship, the Revenge. Then they split apart, and uh, how do I describe this? Uh, they they split apart, and then ultimately they ended up. They both ended up in North Carolina. They, they came back together. They ended up in North Carolina, and. Both of them professed. Blackbeard and Steve Bonnet professed a desire to get a. Pre, a uh, King's pardon for their piracy, which was available at the time, and become honest men. Uh, Steve Bonnet was the first one after after Blackbeard, and Steve Bonnet went to Beaufort Inlet. Steve Bonnet went over to Bath, North Carolina, talked to the governor, get his pardon. By the time he came back, Blackbeard had left <laughs> with all the money, and all the men were gone, and Steve Bonnet was furious. For a little while, he tried to be a non-pirate after getting the pardon, but Steve Bonnet slowly fell into his old ways. He engaged in some piracy. Uh, North Carolina officials were very upset with his depredations, so they sent out uh, this guy, uh, Colonel William Rett, on a ship to go track down Steve Bonnet. Uh, they had a uh, running battle on Cape Fear River. Steve Bonnet and his men were captured. Many of them were killed. They were brought back to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, where they were tried. Steve Bonnet uh, had some fans in Charleston. Other wealthy individuals in Charleston said, hey, judge, you can't 
sentenced Steve Bonnet to being hanged. He's like us. He's a rich. He's a formerly rich guy. He's an aristocrat. He's uh, well educated. He's not a rabble like these other pirates. You can't find him guilty and have him hanged. But the judge was a rather stern individual who decided to follow the law, found Steed Bonnet guilty of piracy and many of his men, and ultimately Steed Bonnet and 19 of his crew were hanged on the edge of the harbor in uh, Charleston. Wow. So that was a, a, a bad end for Steve Bond made a bad decision. And all, all, the, all the guy wanted to do is get away from his wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it must have been a really yeah, bad she marriage. Have, she must have been like, I mean, how bad, how bad must a wife be? Like you're like, oh, I'm going to go hang out with uh, Blackbeard and all the pirates because cause they're so much nicer <laughs> to me than you. <laughs> What a horrible yeah, wife! No, it, yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> All right, so I've got I've got a question in here, and it's a good one from uh, Johnny Dazzle. He wants to know. I guess he was watching on a documentary that the eye patch, like some of these pirates, will have an eye patch over their eye. Mm-hmm. Would they have an eye patch over their eye to keep one eye kind of used to the dark, so that when they when they race down below deck, that they could just swap eye patches, and their eye would automatically. Uh, uh, be used to seeing in the dark, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I, I've read that. I've seen that reference. Uh, I was not able to find any evidence that that is actually happened. Just think about it. Your eyes normalize, acclimatize, or, or deal with different light levels relatively quickly. And you might be at a disadvantage, especially with respect to depth perception, if you kept a patch over one eye all the time. So I'm not buying it, but I, I've heard that before. Uh, but I will say that there were some pirates who had real eye patches because uh, pirates sometimes lost eyes, uh, lost limbs. And one of the fascinating things about the Pirates Code and the articles that the pirates signed is it had one of the earliest forms of workman's compensation. Written into these codes were sentences like, you know, if you, if you lose a, an, an arm or a leg, you are awarded 300 pieces of eight. And we also learn that lefties, I'm a lefty, I'm mostly a lefty, I, I do different things with different hands, but we learned that even back then, lefties were discriminated against because if you lost your right arm, you may get 300 pieces of eight, but if you lost your left arm, you only got 150 pieces of eight. <laughs> All so right. there, there, there were eye patches. Another thing I have to mention, because people always bring it up, are peg legs or wooden legs or hooks like Captain Hook. Okay, back then, even before the 1600s, there were prosthetic uh, arms and hands and and legs. They were made out of wood. Sometimes there was a steel, a claw-like thing uh, for your hand so you could at least grab things roughly. That was real, but there's not a single record of any pirate having a claw for a hand or a wooden leg. And think about it. You're out in the ocean on a rolling ship where you have to perform a lot of duties that require uh, some degree of nimbleness and being able to get around. Uh, Having a wooden leg would be a major uh, disadvantage. So while I don't doubt that there were some pirates who might have had their legs blown off and later in life had a wooden leg, my guess is that once that happened and they got their workman's compensation, they were let off at the nearest port <laughs> or, uh, you know, they, they didn't remain pirates for very, for very long. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, how, how would they be able to, like, if you were on a pirate ship and you lost half your leg, I, I wouldn't imagine they had the great greatest medical care for you. It's not like uh, all these pirate ships had their own doctor, right? Right. No, some pirate ships did have doctors, and doctor. If you did have a doctor, and you, but you have to keep in mind, back then a doctor was different than what we think about a doctor today. Well, back yeah, then it was as, it was much like art as science, and it was almost it was not too far removed from you know witch doctor stuff. Uh, they didn't have a lot of things that they could do, and they didn't know a lot of reasons for diseases. But when it came to amputating somebody's legs, it was very rough. And 
it, it often killed the person or amputating a, a, an arm. But there were doctors on board some pirate ships, and in uh, honor or to reflect their sort of heightened status, uh, they would get a little bit more of the profits from ships that were plundered. Uh, while it's true that the booty was distributed almost evenly, there were a couple of people that were a little bit higher than your average crewman. Your average crewman might get one share, the quartermaster might get one and a half or two shares, the doctor might get two shares, and the captain, whoever that was at the time, would get two shares. So it wasn't a totally equal, but it was pretty darn uh, close. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I suppose we, we've got about uh, 25 minutes left or so, so we're right on schedule, uh, move, <laughs> moving right along. Sam Bellamy. What can oh, you tell yeah. us about Sam him? Bellamy. Well, Sam Bellamy, I, again, I live in Massachusetts. A lot of people around here know Sam Bellamy, but a lot of people around the world do because of what happened to him in the end. Uh, he, uh, we don't know a lot about his early life, which is a common refrain for many of these pirates, but at about 17, 17, 14, 17, 15, he shows up in Cape Cod where he's a fisherman. Uh, and he and another guy, Paul's Grave Williams, who's actually a rel relatively wealthy individual from Newport, decide that they're going to go down to uh, right off Vero Beach in Florida because something very important happened there in the history of piracy. In the summer of 1715, a treasure fleet of ships heading from Central America to Spain and these ships were full of money and jewels and a hurricane struck <laughs> and I think it was 13 or 14 out of 15 ships sank to the bottom of the ocean only a couple of miles off where Vero Beach Florida is today uh, so it wasn't very deep it was less than a couple of miles it wasn't very deep and news of this sinking and all of that treasure being strewn on the ocean floor radiated outwards in the Atlantic world and brought a lot of treasure seekers down to this area to dive on the wrecks. It also brought the Spanish government that tried to fight off these treasure seekers. So some people like Bellamy and Bellamy and Williams went down there trying to get some of the money. Uh, they were unsuccessful as far as we know. A few people were successful, but what happened is so many people went down there to dive on the wrecks, and so many of them were unsuccessful, but they were already in the Caribbean. They already had this money lust within them, so they decided, hey, piracy's taking off again. Why don't we just become pirates? And that's what Bellamy and Williams decided. So I'll leave Williams aside for a little bit, or for most of this. I'll just focus on Bellamy. Williams is with them most of the time. Uh, they went off and they captured about 50 ships, but then they struck it rich. They captured a ship called the Witta, which was a British slave ship. But fortunately for Bellamy and Williams, the Witta had recently, right before they came upon it, had been to Port Royal, Jamaica, one of the biggest slave marts in the Caribbean. And they had sold 500 slaves from Africa. Wow. In return for that, they get a lot of gold dust, gold coins, and pieces of eight. So those were all on board the Witta. So when Bellamy and Williams captured the Witta, they suddenly had 20, maybe 20 to 30,000 pounds sterling worth of treasure, if not more. So, and they, they added to that all the 50 ships they had attacked the pre previous year. So they were sitting pretty and they decided to go north. The plan was actually to go all the way to Maine where they were going to careen the ships, clean them, and decide what to do next. Some people say that uh, Bellamy wanted to go back to Cape Cod where he had a girlfriend, Mary Hallett, but I don't think there's any truth to that story because we have testimony from some of his pirates who got off the ship before uh, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. The ship ultimately sinks, but that said that the plan was to go to Maine, not to go to Cape Cod. But while Bellamy 
and the Witta were off of the elbow of Cape Cod in April of 1717, uh, a nor'easter comes barreling down the coast, you know, bad weather, it's like a cold weather hurricane, comes barreling down the coast, and the Witta sank off of roughly where East Ham uh, um, <clears throat> on the Cape is today, about a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred feet offshore, where Marconi Beach is today. If any of your listeners have been to the Cape Cape Cod, Marconi Beach, where the <clears throat> first wireless uh, telegraphy took place in in the United States. But anyway, so the Witta sank, and down to the bottom of the ocean, and not not very deep, uh, went the ship, and 160 pirates died. And the, Brit the uh, Massachusetts government sent some people out, and they wanted to retrieve all that money because there were two survivors. They weren't able to find the money, and for hundreds of years, people were looking for all that treasure that went down with the Witta. And it wasn't until 1984 that a salvager and uh, amateur historian, a guy named Barry Clifford, using high-tech equipment, he found the remains of the Witta, and over many years, going through the present, they've been pulling out of the water uh, this uh, big stash of money that was on the Witta. And there's a wonderful museum called the Witta Pirate Museum, which is in, where is it, West Yarmouth, I think, West Yarmouth on the Cape. And if you're ever up there, go visit it. It's well worth a visit. And you can see displays of gold doubloons and pieces of eight, and they've pulled up certainly many millions of dollars worth of treasure. And to date, he hasn't sold any of it. He had a bunch of investors, um, but they haven't sold any of it. And recently, there was a big uh, news story. I don't know where it stands right now, but uh, well, let me back up. When you have a ship that sank into the sand hundreds of years ago <clears throat> with all this gold and silver, a lot of the materials of the ship, both the wood and many of the men who died, their bones and the silver and gold form these concretions with sand. They're like huge pieces of conglomerate made up of all different things. And they've been pulling these out of the ocean, and they have archaeologists and other people who are gently going through these concretions, taking them apart and seeing what's within. And not too long ago, they found a number of bones, which they surmise are some of the pirates who went down. And I think they're doing DNA analysis right now to try to figure out who those people might be and if they have ancestors. So that's yeah. kind of neat. Wow. You wonder if they're giving any of the gold to the ancestors, right? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, my, guess, my guess is no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I would guess no, too. So I actually have a, another uh, question in here for you. Uh, Johnny Dazzles asks another one. Any pirate <coughs> stories of sea monsters or UFOs, etc., or ships with special powers? <laughs> None that I came across. Uh, I mean, the, there's, uh, you know, on, on ships, they can see St. Elmo's fire, which is sort of the, I'm not really sure what it is, static electricity or just electricity in the air, and sometimes the masts get a bluish tint to them, and there's something mystical about them. I have no doubt that if we had better records, again, keep in mind, pirates didn't write memoirs. Uh, we don't have day-to-day yeah. -day documentation. They didn't keep journals like regular mariners did, merchant mariners, navy ships, logs. Yeah. So, uh, however, their peers and people in the 1600s and 1700s did see a lot of strange things at sea. Uh, there were still beliefs in krakens and these huge animals that are out there. And if you look at old maps, you can see that they often have these monstrous kinds of uh, things that are uh, that are unknown to us today. So I have no doubt that some pirates uh, saw strange things while they're out at sea, and maybe they attributed it to something that was otherworldly, or just didn't understand what they were what they were seeing. But but I didn't run across any. Any characters there? There are no there are no black pearls out there going down to Davy Jones' locker and uh, what's the name now? 
was it the Black Pearl in the Pirates of the Caribbean yeah, movie? Yeah, when, yeah, when, I think it was when the Black they, Pearl. They came yeah. back with all the dead people on it, right? And yeah, they, they, yeah, I, I don't think that kind of stuff happened. <laughs> all right, what about mermaids? Mermaids, that's an interesting story. I, I don't know a huge about about mermaids, but they, they run through history a lot. And uh, some people think that mermaids were just uh, dugongs or manatees that were seen in the light of the moon and people's imagination uh, took off. But let me come at it a different way. If there really were mermaids, don't you think by now we would have seen them? Just like if Megalodon was still around, uh, you know, if you saw The Deep with uh, Jason Statham, which is an awesome movie. <laughs> but if there was a megalodon, if there was a 50, 60-foot shark living be beneath a thermocline in the Marianas Trench, which isn't there anyway, <laughs> do you think, don't you think we would have seen them by now? Uh, so I'm not a big believer in mermaids. Uh, no? But... Well, you never know, I suppose, <laughs> right? They could yeah, be I, out there somewhere. I would love it if you, if you, I would love it if somebody found a mermaid. For the same reason, I think it would be fascinating if they found the Loch Ness monster. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't know. The, the Loch Ness monster is probably dead now, right? <laughs> yeah, if it was ever, if it was ever alive. But <laughs> now, are there any, are there any of their ships still around, or any of these vessels still around anywhere today? Any no. of them? No, there. I mean, the remains of the, there's some boards or pieces of wood that they found in cannons with, with the widow. But think about it. Uh, this is the era of the Great Age of Sail. These are wooden ships, and uh, they're subject to rot and marine worms and just yeah. the, the ravages of age. Think about this. This is another way to think about it. I wrote a book on whaling called Leviathan, the history of whaling in America. At one time, there were, you know, close to 800 American whaling ships, all like the Charles Morgan, which is at Mystic Seaport. There were, there were over, you know, a century, <clears throat> there were well over a thousand whaling ships. The only one that survived is the Charles W. Morgan, and the only reason that it survived is because a rich guy <clears throat> in New Bedford in the 1920s decided to put it in dry dock and save it. So these things don't, they don't last. I mean, the gold and silver coins, if you find them in the ocean, they last. Yeah, but just the be ships, a pile the of ships coins down there. No. That would be cool if we had, uh, you know, uh, still had a pirate ship. Well, you and, know, some of these uh, mermaid, you know, these mermaid tales, even if we did hear, is it true that they made their sails out of hemp? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was, that was used back then. I think it was hemp and cotton and duck fabric, but... Yeah, I think hemp is a. I mean, today you can get hemp shirts and, and yeah, see, sheets. I'm sure and you got to like wonder if, yeah. if they were growing hemp for their sales. What what were they doing? <laughs> what were they doing with the rest of the plant? Right, with with the, all the rum and and hemp that they had laying around. You got to wonder if maybe they weren't seeing mermaids. That that could be. I I, I don't actually know the history of marijuana. I, I don't know how long ago people realized it's uh, site. Uh, S not psychotic. What's the word? Psychedelic. Know, the, 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 it's, it's, it's qualities, ability to change your perception. I wonder, I don't know how far back that goes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, uh, it's been around for a while. I think the Indians were smoking it in their peace pipe, weren't they? I don't, I, I don't think that was, was that marijuana or peyote or mushrooms? Other, they, they were doing other stuff. Yeah, there have yeah, been drugs around for forever. All, the Indians, they were all into that, <laughs> you know, all into those, all into those psychedelic drugs. All right, yeah. so, so uh, I guess we, we got about ten minutes. And who is Edward Lowe? Oh, <laughs> Edward Lowe. This is funny. One of the yeah, funny, but uh, w w when the book came out, I did a lot of radio interviews and. And also at talks, I would always get asked this question, who's my favorite pirate? And I would have to rephrase it because favorite sort of implies liking. Uh, these guys, I'd love to have a drink with some of these guys just to pick <laughs> brains, but they they're, pretty miserable. they're pretty miserable individuals. But uh, the one that I found the most fascinating was Edward Lowe, just because he was, 
I think he was psychotic. He was just he was one of the meanest, nastiest uh, pirates you could imagine. One of his signature moves was to cut the uh, lips and ears off of the people that he captured and roast them and force them to eat their own flesh before he ran them through with his cutlass. Oh my God! He one time he caught he caught a Spanish ship that had a lot of uh, had a bag of gold and silver on board, and the uh, captain of the ship uh, had uh, t- tied this bag to a rope. And it was over the side of the ship, apparently. I guess he knew the handwriting of the wall. And when the pirates came on board, he cut the rope so the bag of money went into the ocean instead of into the pirates' hands. But unfortunately for that captain, somebody on the ship told Edward Lowe what had happened. Edward Lowe and his men were so upset that they killed the captain and then all 38 members of his crew. So so he was just a nasty guy. He wasn't particularly successful. He captured a number of ships, didn't uh, you know, didn't succeed in gathering any large amount of money, but one of the things that he's most remembered for is he was like uh, American enemy number 1, most wanted. And this guy Peter Solgard, who was a captain of a British warship called the Greyhound was in search of Lowe and his compatriot, Charles Harris, who was on another ship. And he found him off the coast, uh, not too far from around Rhode Island. And there was this uh, this battle, but Solgard went after Harris's ship because he thought that was Lowe's ship because it was the larger and more powerful of the two. But it wasn't, and Lowe showed his true character. Instead of coming to the aid of his fellow pirate, it was actually his sort of lieutenant, they had been uh, – Lowe had given Charles Harris this ship after they had captured another vessel. Instead of coming to the aid of Charles Harris, Lowe and his men on their ship just took off. And uh, Harris was captured by the Greyhound, brought into Newport, Rhode Island, and ultimately after a trial, 23 of the pirates that had formerly been part of Lowe's fleet were found guilty and uh, – hanged right there in Newport, the largest hanging until the mid-1800s. It was another large hanging. It's escaping me. I talk about it in the book, but I'm forgetting what it was. Uh, I think it's had something to do with slavery, though. But anyway, there was um, – so Lowe escaped, and what really happened to him, we don't know. He he attacked a number of fishing vessels off Nova Scotia, and then – depending on which history you believe, he either was marooned by his men because he had become too wild and crazy. Uh, Another story has that he killed his quartermaster, and again, the men decided to maroon him or send him off on a boat because he could no longer be trusted. And uh, then there's one other story that comes from a French source, which is basically that a French ship captured Lowe and his men and uh, I think uh, ultimately he was hanged someplace. So I, I don't know what happened to him. We don't really know exactly, but he he had a short, uh, bloody career. And the, the the reason he's most interesting to me is again I live in Marblehead. One of the fishing ships that he captured off Nova Scotia had a bunch of Marblehead men on board, and he tried to get a bunch of them to sign on to become pirates. This one guy, Philip Ashton, refused to become a pirate, and uh, when they were down in the Bay of Honduras, when Philip Ashton was on Lowe's ship down in the Bay of Honduras, he went to a local uninhabited island called Roatan with other men on the ship to get water, and while he was there, he ran into the brush and basically escaped. They tried to look for him for a while, but then they took off. And Philip Ashton lived on that island for almost two years, uninhabited island, by himself until he was rescued by a British, by an American ship who uh, came by the island. And Philip Ashton, when he got back to Marblehead, with the help of the local minister, uh, there was a book written about his travails, uh, living alone for uh, nearly two years. And keep in mind, this is right after uh, Daniel Defoe had 
written uh, the book Robinson Crusoe, and here this guy Philip Ashton was America's very own Robinson Crusoe. So it was a very popular book, and it's kind of neat just because it's in my hometown that part of the story transpired. Yeah, you know, there <laughs> certainly are an interesting amount of stories that come out of that Massachusetts area. For uh, I see Dark Dark <laughs> yeah. Hours in here. He's all excited. We're talking about uh, Marblehead, Massachusetts. He's like, all right. Now, let me ask you a question. Did, did uh, pirates have any special weapons that only pirates had? I was reading here. Uh, uh, let me see here. I'm looking for the... Oh, here we go. Sapphire Elf says, My blacksmith friend showed me a boarding axe. Um, it's an axe with an eyelet for a rope on the, on the head so you can slam into the side of a wooden ship from a skiff to stay alongside it. Did they have, did they have like their <laughs> own special weapons? Uh, I'm not aware of any, but think about it. They didn't have foundries. They weren't blacksmiths on board pirate ships. They basically took from their surrounding environment, uh, and, and that, that included armaments. So I think almost all the armaments that, uh, pirates would have had at the time would have been ones that you would see on other ships. I mean, cutlasses, uh, matchlock, uh, you know, pistols, uh, sometimes uh, muskets, but that was more unusual. Their their biggest weapon were cannons, and they were relatively small because these ships were not that large. You know, they would have four-pound, six-pound cannons, swivel guns, and four pound, six pound, that's that's the weight of the ball that comes out of the cannon, not the weight of the, yeah, and the cannon. That's another question for you. I mean, how many hits from a cannon can a ship take before it sinks? I mean, you think just one <laughs> cannonball would put a, a hole in the ship and sink it, right? Uh, no. It's a bit, well, it depends on how far you are when you're firing. It depends on how heavy the ball is, and it depends on how thick and uh, strong the planking is on the ship you're trying to – to, 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 to attack or sink. That's gotta be, that's I mean, gotta some, be of the, some of these ships, a lot of them were made out of, you know, very tough oak, uh, sometimes live oak. And as a result, uh, unless if you had a four pound or a six pound cannon and you were quite a ways off, I mean, there's only a certain amount, the trajectory and the length uh, you can propel these balls. You can't shoot them for miles and miles. You have to be within, you know, hundreds of feet or hundreds of yards to even score a hit, and then you're bobbing in the ocean, so you have to have good aim. Uh, so it wasn't all that common for cannonballs to go clear through the hull below the waterline and into the ship, although it did happen. I just finished a book. Uh, my next book's on privateering, which some people might be interested in because it's related to piracy, sort of, not really. And I'm looking at privateering in the American Revolution, and there's one account that I talk about. There's a British warship that battled a relatively large privateer, American privateer, and the British captain got so enraged with the American privateer because he wouldn't immediately surrender to a much more powerful force after being strafed with some bullet fire and a couple of small cannons that the British captain ordered his men to haul out the big guns, the 12 and 18 pound cannons that are huge. And he sent a couple of those over to the privateer ship and those went clear through the hull of the ship and uh, the ship started sinking. So the British uh, sailors had to put out their longboats and they actually saved a lot of these privateers from drowning. So if you had a big cannon or you were close and had a small cannon and you weren't battling a ship that had especially thick timbers, yeah, you could cause some real damage to the hull. All right. And what about uh, singing pirates? <laughs> singing. I, I, I don't know. Did Again, they, they sing a lot? Do they have like their I, own oh, songs? I'm sure, that, I'm sure they sang a lot. I mean, I, we don't have... No, there's not, nothing written that says, oh, they sang a lot. But we do know that some pirates articles actually had little uh, uh, comments about the orchestra. There were orchestras, or at least people that could play instruments on board pirate ships, and they were supposed to play at certain times of day. And there's no doubt that pirates sang in the sense of shanties. Those have been around since forever while doing work, hauling up the anchor, whatever. So I'm sure there was singing, and especially when they got some rum into them, they must have been singing 
songs that were popular <laughs> in the day. That was a very common thing that would happen in a bar. Why wouldn't it happen on a pirate ship? But I, I'd never read an account of a contemporary saying, hey, these pirates sang all night. If I would imagine pirates singing, it would be in a real deep voice, very angry like. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. but I'm sure they did. Full of anger. Well, yeah. Eric J. Dolan, it certainly is a pleasure having you on. I, I hope you enjoyed yourself and we can get you back on for uh, another show. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a show on hurricanes or lighthouses or something. It, it definitely is a, a really interesting uh, topic. I, I love the whole pirate idea. I think I would be a really good pirate. What do you guys think? I think uh, I think I think I, I could probably be the best pirate that there is if yeah. there are pirates out there today. I'd be a hey, good can one. I, can, I, can I add one other thing real quick? Yeah, of course. Oh, just because uh, <clears throat> your listeners, if you're interested in learning more about this book or some of my other books, I do have a website, and the reason I mention it is my website, I have the first chapter of each one of my books on the website, so you can read to see what the general layout of the book is. And my website's very simple. It's www.ericjdolan, that's E-R-I-C-J-A-Y-D-O-L-I-N, ericjdolan.com. And so if you're interested in any of these books, and the book that we're talking about today is Black Flags, Blue Waters, The Epic History of America's Most Notorious Pirates. You can get it anywhere. I will let you know that on – I just found out that on June 23rd – is it June 20? Yeah, around June 23rd or 24th, there's something called BookBub. I don't know if you know about it, but it's this, this uh, company that basically has huge mailing lists, and they advertise uh, deep discounts on uh, e-books. So I know that if you are a Kindle reader or a Nook reader or an iBook reader, uh, around June 23rd for a couple of days, I think it's a week, Black Flags Blue Waters will be on sale for $2.99. <laughs> so I just found that out. So you can get a cheap version if you want to read the ebook, But uh, the paperback's pretty cheap, and you still can get hardcovers. But anyway, I hope people, if they're interested in what they heard tonight and they want to keep a writer like me employed, well, I, you Go know, I, I did uh, I did spell your name wrong, didn't I? I don't know how I did that. I guess I was just going off of... of uh... Oh, you did A-N probably. Everybody yeah, does yeah, that. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I'll, I'll no, fix it's... that as soon as we're off here. But I was going to ask you about uh, your website link. And, of course, it's in the description box below, guys. Go check it out. You can also find Eric J. Dolan on Facebook. He is a real... You know, just uh, look for Eric J. Dolan, and I think author will come up next to it. Just click on that, and it'll take you... Right to right. his Facebook author page. So, I noticed you're not on Twitter. So, no, no, I I am on Twitter, but what I I I focus more on Facebook because the only reason I use social media is you know I'm an older guy. It's not it's not, it's not my natural environment, but the only reason I use it is to help connect with potential readers and to help my my career. So the, my Facebook page, my author page, has about 16,000 followers, and most of what I post is either about uh, nature, which I love, but also a lot of it's about my books or history topics. Uh, I have a personal Facebook page, which I hardly ever use, which only has about 500. I have like 500 friends. But Twitter, I started that, and I just found out whenever I post anything about history or about my book or about a talk that I was giving, I got no response. There was no traction. And it was just, I like Facebook better because I can actually write a couple of paragraphs and post an interesting picture. Uh, I have problems with other things about Facebook, but <laughs> with respect to me as a writer and connecting with potential readers, I found that Facebook is very enjoyable because I get a lot of comments from people about my posts, and sometimes we get into conversations. So I am on Twitter, but I don't, I'm not very active on Twitter. All right, so uh, everybody get out there and buy Black Flags, <laughs> Blue Waters by Eric J. Dolan. Uh, everybody's into that, you know, I mean, goodness, two ninety nine for for the Kindle. I mean, go ahead and do it. Yeah. You know, even if, you, even if you don't read it, go buy the book and support Eric J. Dolan. Thank you very much for coming on, man. We certainly oh. do appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate that. All Thank right. Very much. So hang on a minute and we'll get right I'll get right back to you in a minute as soon as I wrap this up here. Just want to let everybody know you can find us at 
www.conflictradio.net. You can find us on all of your podcast catchers, Apple iTunes, iHeartRadio. We're on Spreaker. And, um, well, I guess uh, my usual outing is very, I guess, fitting for today. Batten down the hatches. <laughs>